I'd like to turn, first of all, to Romans chapter 5. A few readings. Verse 6 of Romans chapter 5. Father, please speak to us in your precious word. Amen? You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So he didn't wait for you to get godly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. <laughs> There's a lot of difference between a righteous man and a good man, but that's another subject. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath? Through This is a very powerful argument. This is, uh, this is brilliant. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Leave it there because... That's not my main theme this morning. I'm, I'm just taking one little aspect out of this, and that is the verse, for if when we were God's enemies. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. There's that word again. But I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Of course, Jesus is talking to those under law. Um, you love your you love so that you may be become the sons of God. We love because we are the sons and daughters of God. There's a profound difference. He causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the un righteous okay now we look at uh, Luke chapter 6 we'll look at verse 32 we'll start there if you love those who love you what credit is that to you even sinners love those who love them and if you do good to those who are good to you what credit is that to you even sinners do that if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will become sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Just to say there that uh, how often have you heard that when there's something like a mice plague in the west of New South Wales, out west, or there's a drought, or bushfires, or earthquake in some country like Turkey or somewhere, Christians are very quick to say, oh, that's the judgment of God. Maybe. But it says here that He's kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Is that right? So maybe you need to rethink your theology if you're one of those who says it's the judgment of God. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're wrong. So let's look at John 3 verse 36. John chapter 3 verse 36. Just one verse, verse 36 in verse um, chapter 3. Whoever believes in the Son of God has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. God's wrath remains, or abides, or lives, as in a house, on him. So it looks a bit contradictory there, doesn't it? Well, let's have a look at that. I just was thinking this morning, I said to Heather, this business, what's going on in Israel today? You know that they're enemies of God, they're enemies of the gospel, but for the patriarch's sake, this is in uh, Romans 11, they're beloved of God. Enemies of the gospel, 
but they're because of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're beloved of God. And they still are today as a natural people. But as you know, that the world is unable to deal with Israel, hates Israel, because Satan hates Israel. So it just lies about them all the time. And I said to Heather, it reminds me of the, uh, the, the knight in shining, shining armor that came back to his castle. And the king said, so how, what's been happening? He said, oh, he said, I've, I've been uh, pillaging all the villages and destroying the villages and, uh, and, and killing all the king's enemies in the west. And the king said, what? I don't have any enemies in the west. He said, well, you do now. <laughs> so what's happening there, of course, the Palestinians attack Israel and they respond and makes the whole situation worse. Makes it, it, so I, anyway, get, getting back to this, I heard of a guy on his, 18th, uh, on his 100th birthday and he was uh, being interviewed by a man, a reporter, and the, the reporter said to him, so what are you most proud of? And his face lit up and he said, well, he said, I don't have an enemy in the whole wide world. And that's wonderful, said the reporter. He said, and what do you put that down to? Well, he said, they're all dead. And that's how a lot of people wish their enemies were and would ultimately be. So we need to ask ourselves this morning two questions. What is our attitude toward our enemies? You might say, well, I don't have any enemies. That can be arranged. Uh, and what is God's attitude towards his enemies? Now, God's attitude is to bless them because he says in Romans, overcome evil with good. Uh, so how do I know that he does that? Because he doesn't tell us to do something he doesn't do himself. One of my favorite verses is in Romans chapter 2, verse 4. It's the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. God's kindness leads you to repentance. So God's, God's attitude is to bless. Now, we need to face some facts. Uh, not everybody wants to be your friend. Uh, we all make enemies, and this is what stat statistics say. Now, somebody once said there are lies, there are damn lies, and then there are statistics. But statistics say that one in every 10 people that you meet will take an instant dislike to you. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, does it? Until you think to yourself that if there are 8 billion people in the world, 800 million people don't like you at all. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a bit painful to think about, isn't it? <laughs> a lot of people don't like us. Uh, I've been in the ministry now long enough to know there are some people take an instant dislike to you. I worked, when, when I was in the UK, I'd been three years in the ministry and because I was doing a lot of evangelism, uh, they put me in a church so I could assist and go out and do evangelism. And so I worked with a, a, as a, with a senior pastor, a good man. Um, I was only there a relatively short time, about probably, I don't know, a year, year and a half. Anyway, his wife took an instant dislike to me older than I was and she just didn't like me and I didn't know about it I didn't know about it I just thought everybody loved everybody until one day the youth pastor and his wife took me aside and they said we've just got to warn you I said warn me what of and they said Mrs. so-and-so has got it in for you I said what oh yes she does not like you at all I said why thinking how could anybody not love me she said, well, she's jealous for her husband's sake. Now, I can't vouch for that. But I do know that one day, in the middle of a meeting, in the middle of a meeting, at the end of a meeting, end of a prayer meeting, she went for my juggler. She went for me. In fact, she went for me so much. It was only myself and her husband and her there. So much, he actually turned around and said, shut up, you what he said yeah but it's too late so I had to leave shortly after but I just couldn't understand why in church life somebody intensely disliked somebody and then when I went then to another place there was a lady there who was having an affair with the previous pastor uh, 
who resigned and then told the whole church that I sacked her. And then when Heather came along and played the, the it was the organ then, wasn't it? You couldn't play the piano. It was the organ. Yeah. Uh, anyway, she told everybody that I sacked her, then sent me a letter threatening to sue me, to take me to court. <laughs> Put that on the list, Rob. <laughs> she, she sent me a letter. So, and then I was accused by the son. A reporter came and said, I hear you've got a night bride sleeping with your fiancé. And I'm like absolutely stunned with what all this is going on. And then I read about myself in seven, seven national newspapers. How to spoil a good story. Yeah. <laughs> seven national newspapers uh, we were in. And uh, I read about myself in the news of the world. Yeah. Um, pop orientated minister Sachs organist to install his wife oh, sorry his fiance yeah so yeah but uh, uh, and of course I learned something in those days of what it is and what it was to have enemies in the church I couldn't hardly believe it but uh, listen to this this is Kevin Vest's Greek great Greek scholar his his translation of um, uh, these verses in uh, Peter. He says this, Galatians 5.15, sorry. Now this is what the verse is. He said, but if you bite and devour one another in partisan strife, be careful that you and your whole fellowship are not consumed by one another. He's talking to a church. And this is what Kevin Vest says. He says, the words bite, devour and consumed were commonly used in classical Greek in connection with wild animals in a deadly struggle. Oop. The Apostle Paul knew something that we don't know. We really need to guard our fellowship and guard our attitude and, and protect the peace and tranquility that God gives us. It's, you've got to work on that. That is absolutely vital. As I said, that's, that was said to a church. And then there's, there's enemies in families. Families have enemies. Perhaps more there than any other area. I remember when I was, uh, I, mean, I won't say where, there was a lady uh, who said to me, her sister wouldn't speak to her. Um, that was actually in Tweed Heads. She said, my sister won't speak to me. She lives in Mwollomba. She just will not speak to me. Will you come with me and see if we can talk to her? And we drove down there. We knew she was home, banged on the door. No answer. She would not come out. She would not speak to her. Shortly afterwards, the lady uh, in our church died, died of cancer. And uh, we took the funeral, but the sister wouldn't come to the funeral. Where does that enmity, that bitterness, that rancor, where does that come from? And then sometimes it happens in a marriage. People, no one, no one ever gets married expecting they're going to get divorced, but it happens, alas. No judgment on that from me. But people begin loving one another and be, begin being friends and end, end, end up hating one another. In fact, recently we've had a spate of people, women and children being burnt to death. What sort of hatred is that? So... We all understand something of having a wrong mind. And what is our attitude to God before we were born again? It's interesting. Romans 8, 7 says, The sinful man is enmity against God, hostile against God. Greek means to be at war with God. Before you got saved, you might not believe this, but I'm telling you what the scripture says. Your, your heart and mind were enemies of God you, you hated God um, I've had people in this church even over the years who didn't believe the doctrine of total depravity they didn't like the doctrine of total depravity and their doctrine was well if we just love one another everything will be all right Forgetting, in fact, they hated doctrine forgetting that the Apostle Paul says to Timothy give, give yourself to doctrine and guard your life and doctrine. Give yourself to these things. 
But no, they had the idea that everybody was converted. So if they met a Catholic priest who didn't believe the gospel, but went around giving the last rites to somebody, and if they were like really nice to them, that, that, or we shouldn't judge. In other words, you couldn't tell the difference between a sheep and a goat. You shouldn't judge. We should just love everybody and everything's going to be all right. And a couple of times I preached on this particular doctrine, man's depravity, and voila, they left the church. Gone. They didn't like that. Not that it's necessarily what... Uh, it's, it's what the word of God is saying. Um, give yourself to doctrine. Now the key is this. What is God's attitude? What was God's attitude? God, God wants reconciliation. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what the scripture says. Yet at the same time, We've got a problem because Psalm 7 verse 11 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. How do we deal with that? It's not too bad if you think of it this way. God is very complicated. He's not like you and me. He really can talk and think and be two things at the same time. Now, Chrissy told me today that she was going to be looking out at the horses and listening to me preaching at the same time. And I said, no, we can't do two things. Yes, I can. I can do two things. But, but apparently you can't. Oh, Chrissy can, but apparently the rest of you can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God is very, very complicated. And that, that to me helps me understand. I don't understand his complicated, but it helps me understand the things that I don't understand. It helps me get by when I read these sorts of things. I don't see it as a contradiction. Because we were enemies and Christ died for us. We were enemies, right? We were enemies. Um, so now you might uh, say, say to yourself, well, yeah, we were enemies. Well, you know, well, I agree with that. We, we didn't like God. But apparently, the context here, the context is that it was God who was our enemy. People say, oh, but God was always our friend, always, you know, God always loved us and, and, and he wanted to embrace us and love us. And, but we were enemies. But that's not true. He was he was an enemy of us. He was an enemy of, of us. Um, and you're going to ask me how I knew this. Well, it's like this. If Jesus on the cross rep represented you when he died, what was God's attitude to him? He turned away from him. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to death that's God's attitude to those that he loves so as I said it's a very complicated subject running away with just one aspect of that doctrine won't do you have to look at both of those there <clears throat> um, I once spoke to an American teacher preacher a very famous author of many books and uh, he was a grace preacher, and I said to him, I said, um, can you explain John 3.36 in the light of grace? Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever has not that, that, that life doesn't have the Son. The wrath of God lives on him. Can you explain that? He said, no, I don't understand it. He was honest. I don't understand it. But it can be understand if you understood if you understand that God is complex. Because God loves his enemies, but they're still enemies. But God loves his enemies. Now we have to ask ourselves something about God's attitude. That settled indignation lives on them unless they repent and believe. And it will abide on them forever because that word abide is in the present tense. It means to stay. It doesn't just lift every now and then. They are alienated from God. Ephesians 
uh, 2 verse 12, alienated from God without hope, without God in the world. The um, great Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that this verse, uh, there's nothing more terrible. Nothing more terrible. You're right, sweetheart? Okay. Bless you, darling. Okay. Yeah. So getting back to this, um, there's nothing more terrible than that verse of Scripture without hope and without God in the world. <laughs> Father, we pray for our beloved sister, Lord. We pray that right now you release that foot, Lord, completely. Heal her in the name of Jesus. Dear Father, touch her right now. In your precious name. Amen, Lord. Hanny's a nurse. She can help you. Bless your heart, darling. Okay. Okay, we'll, 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 uh, we'll plow on. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're saved? So far? Good. Okay. Um, I was reading something somebody said the other day. They said... This is not just theoretic, the, the, theoretical theology. This is fact. That, that's how we were. We were without hope and without God. And then they said, that's, this is why a lot of Christians still aren't rejoicing and laughing. Why some Christians just don't get excited and jump for joy? He said, because they don't realize the enormity of their salvation, what they've been saved from. We were once without any hope at all, without God. Well, so in a sense, you're saying to me now that I'm saying, well, God loves us and hates us at the same time. Um, and you say, well, I thought God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, which he did. Um, but you have to remember that God loved us so much that he saved us from himself he had to save us from his own wrath and indignation he literally saved us from himself he didn't have to have anything to do with us but he loved us and saved us from his own indignation and that's what God wants to do he wants to make friends of his enemies that's his attitude um, do you remember in the Old Testament, you've got in uh, uh, 2 Kings 5, the story of Naaman? And the, the story begins, now Naaman was the commander of the king's army, Aram. Uh, Aramea is Syria. And so Naaman was the commander of the whole army. And they used to attack Israel all the time. What's changed? Because Syria has been also firing rock rockets in this Barney that's going on at the moment. They've been firing rockets after all these years. Now, he was a mighty man, um, highly esteemed among his men, but he had leprosy. Remember that? Now, bands, groups from Aram had gone down into Israel and had captured, they'd probably killed the parents, a little girl. And they took the little girl home and she became Naaman's, Naaman's wife's servant. Cleaned and cooked and worked in the garden and run errands. And she was this sweet little thing. And God, in his love and mercy, put her there. Just in the same way that he's put you in circumstances and situations that you find very, very difficult. Because God is love. And you, you made a serious mistake. You once gave yourself to him unconditionally. Do you remember that? Hello? You said, Lord, I give myself to you. Do as you will with my life. And he did. And you thought it's terrible what he did with your life. Or you thought he got it wrong. Or you thought I've stepped out of it. No, you gave yourself to him. You committed yourself to him. He's sovereign. And this little girl was there on a divine mission because one day she said, if only my master 
would go and see the prophet who was in Israel, he would heal him of his leprosy. No one had ever been healed of leprosy before. And especially the enemy. Where did this little girl get this faith from? From God who put her there. And the, the wife said to Naaman, she said, well, this little girl says, you can be healed of this terrible leprosy. So he went to the king, and you know the story. The king sent him down to Israel, and uh, the king tore his clothes. And then uh, Elisha said, oh, don't tear your clothes. Send him to me. And then he sent him to Elisha, and he said, go and wash in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman went away angry, really cheesed off, because this dirty little river called the Jordan. There were better rivers called the Golden and the Swift up in Syria. Why couldn't he wash in them and be cleansed? My master, they said to him, if you had been asked to do some great, hard, difficult thing, you would have done it. But all he's saying is wash and be cleansed. So he went and got down in the river and washed and cleansed. And he got up and his skin was like that of a baby boy. Jesus used this story in Nazareth when he was speaking about, of all subjects, election. He said there were many lepers in the days of uh, Elisha. But only one was healed. <laughs> that was Naaman. Naaman! The Syrian, the enemy, your enemy, what? Remember when they heard that, they tried to kill him. They were so incensed, so full of anger. And then there was a time when, um, Heather mentioned this story this morning, it's in 2 Kings 6, when the Arameans came down again, came to a town called Dothan, where Elisha was and his servant, and, uh, uh, well, they, they were on their way down from the hills. And you'd, you'd alluded to the fact that uh, the servant got up early and said, oh, look at this, look at all the chariots, look at all the horses coming down the hills towards us. And Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. And he looked up, and there around about them were the Lord's army, the chariots of fire, horses and chariots of fire. So Elisha went up and met them as they came down to Dothan. He said, you're in the wrong place. Or oh, I should say, um, he said, first of all, Lord, strike them with blindness. And the whole, lot, the whole army was made blind. And then he said to them, and you're, you're in the wrong place. You're looking for the wrong man. Come with me, I'll lead you. So he led them. And he led them to the capital called Samaria. Samaria was the capital of Israel. Ten tribes, not Jerusalem and Judah and Benjamin, but the ten tribes. And they were practicing terrible idolatry. That's why they came under judgment. And so he led them to Samaria and suddenly the Lord opened their eyes and there they were all standing in the middle of the enemy's city, Samaria. Oh, And the king, Joram, said, Ha ha, my father, he said to, to Elisha, shall we kill them? Twice he said, shall we kill them? And Elisha said, no, 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 let's feed them. Let's bless them. And it says they prepared a great feast and fed them. They ate and they drank. And then they went back to Aramea, Syria. And it says there at the end of the chapter, chapter 6, that the army stopped invading Israel. Grace. Overcome evil with goodness. Don't be overcome but overcome with goodness. God is kind to the ungodly. God is kind to the wicked. God is kind. He's gracious. He's kind. So we need to rethink sometimes how our ideas of God sometimes get uh, altered and shifted because of things uh, that are more traditional viewpoints of, of God. Nothing great and radical in there. It's just, just a fact. They stopped raiding. They, their hearts were changed because of that uh, gesture of friendship and kindness, which God continues to do to everybody. He changes hostile people into friends. We love him because he first loved us. He does not say, clean up your act. Stop sinning. And I'll save you. He doesn't say, repent, and then I'll start doing something for you. Because repentance doesn't mean what we think it does. It just means a change of mind. That's the word. 
to change your mind. And when you come to God, you automatically repent. That's what repentance is. You're going one way, you turn around and go another way. And it's when you come to God that the repentance begins of cleaning up your life. God doesn't say, clean up your life and then you can come to me. Spurgeon once said, to say that is like saying to a man who's freezing cold, freezing cold and shivering and shaking. And it's like saying to that man, get warm and then you can come and stand by my fire. That's not how it works. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Well, you say, and I can hear you saying that up the back there, all two of you. It's easy for you to talk about being kind and blessing people, forgiving people. Um, I can hear you saying, how can I forgive someone when I don't trust them? And how can I forgive someone who keeps breaking a promise? And why should I forgive someone who doesn't ask for it and bless them? Why should I forgive and bless when they, then I'm the one that was wronged, they were the ones that were in the wrong? And how can you forgive someone when you're still hurting and in pain? And you're still distressed. And should I forgive someone while they're out to destroy me? How do you forgive someone who doesn't even know they've hurt you? You do what Jesus did when he was on the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How do you forgive someone who doesn't know what they're doing? Now, I want you to notice that Jesus on the cross didn't forgive them himself. He couldn't. Where all before the cross, he would say, your sins are forgiven. You're forgiven. You're forgiven. But now, he's the victim. As the victim, he could only say, Father, forgive them. And that is one of the answers to this question of how do we bless those who are hurting us. He made the world, but the world didn't know him or recognize him. There was no room in the inn for him at his birth. Herod tried to kill him when he was born. For three years, his enemies tried to kill him. He was betrayed. He was abandoned. He was given a mock trial. He was beaten, spat on, and nailed to a cross. And when he was on that cross, he, he prayed for their forgiveness. Now, now, this is important. Listen to this. He prayed for people for their forgiveness when they had done and were doing their worst. That answers, that covers a number of questions, doesn't it? He prayed for their forgiveness. When the nails were being driven into him, he prayed for their forgiveness. When the pain was the fiercest and his wounds were still open, he prayed for their forgiveness. When the cross was being dropped with a thud into the hole and his bones were dislocated, all my bones are out of joint, the psalmist said. He prayed for their forgiveness. When his nerves were most tender, when the pain was unfathomable, he prayed for their forgiveness. When he was the victim of the world's greatest crime, he prayed for their forgiveness. How do we know he prayed for his Didn't he just pray once, Father, forgive? No, because the Greek in Luke 23, 34 implies he kept on praying for their forgiveness. He didn't just say it once and it was over. For the whole time, he was praying, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. That's the answer to how. It leaves us with no excuse. And he brought them to repentance. Some of the soldiers, the hardest men in the world, were watching this. You think, oh God, how can you save a man like that? How can you save a hard man? The same way he saved you and me. We were hard too. We were all enemies of God. A number of those soldiers believed when they saw what had happened. 
And then after Jesus rose from the dead, the day of Pentecost, 5,000 during that first week believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 6, 7, a great number of the temple priests confessed Jesus as Lord. Do you know, I was thinking when I was reading this and writing this, I thought, um, in heaven you'll meet somebody one day. And they'll say, if you say, share your testimony, they'll say, they'll say this has got to be somebody there. They'll say, well, I was actually there when this happened. What? I was one of them who mocked him. I was one of them who shouted out, crucify him. I was there and I found forgiveness because he prayed to the Father for my forgiveness. Now in the light of all this, self-righteousness and I don't have to do, I don't have to apologize and I don't have to forgive and I don't have to be kind and I don't have to do this or do that. That's quite repugnant to God. Um, Pastor Erwin Lutzer, he um, describes one of his friends on a plane who was sharing the gospel with a woman who thought she was good enough to go to heaven. <laughs> and he asked her, what, um, what would you do if in fact your works weren't good enough? And she said, oh, I would tell God that he should lighten up. <laughs> Whoa. Lighten up. Calvary tells us God can't lighten up. He can't lighten up. Isaiah 53.10, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Is that a waste of time? As this woman thinks? No. It was the will of the Lord to put him to grief and to cause him to suffer. It was the Lord's will. He had to. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to death. It was the Lord. Because there was no other way. God couldn't lighten up because God is holy. He had to send his son. There was no other way unless he just totally left us, abandoned us as enemies and ignored us. So it leaves us without excuse of, of being... Um, Proactive when it comes to enemies. Hello? If I do that, that's important. It leaves us without any excuse for not being proactive when it comes to our enemies. Now, I hope you're thinking, gosh, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to me? Um, but I can hear you once again in the back row saying, yes, but Jesus said, if your brother repents seven times, forgive him. So if they don't ask, they don't get. Good question. You must forgive, whether they repent or not, ultimately. Because you'll end up in a prison of pain and sorrow and bitterness and resentment. Because the person who's the most blessed when you forgive is you <laughs> it's you and if the person doesn't ask for forgiveness as happened on the cross take it to the Lord and give it to him and ask him to forgive but you know it's very hard to ask the Lord to forgive someone if you don't forgive yourself if you're not willing to forgive them try and ask the Father to forgive them if you're not willing to forgive them yourself. I read of a woman who went to her pastor and she told her how her husband had left her 10 years earlier for another woman. Um, and she said, since then my life has been eaten away by resentment and bitterness. And the pastor said, you need to forgive your husband. She said, why should I forgive him? He's ruined the last 10 years of my life. Because, the pastor said, if you don't forgive him, he'll ruin the next 10 years of your life. <laughs> so true. I'm finishing now. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate, forgiving, forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you. 
forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Unconditionally, sacrificially, unilaterally, Christ has forgiven you. Unconditionally, unilaterally, sacrificially, as Christ has forgiven you. Um, there was a, a pastor called Pastor Walt Everett, Everett and he tells a story about how, um, how unprepared he was when he answered the phone one night and he found that his son, his son Scott had been murdered and by a guy called uh, Mike. And he, he describes, in this story, he describes how uh, the, 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 the anger just raged through him like, a, like an ocean. And, uh, and it made it worse when Mike, the killer, got off with a bargain plea and got a reduced sentence. And uh, he said, and I quote, my rage was infecting my entire life. How am I going to get rid of this anger? He said the answer came the first time he saw Mike was a year later when Mike was in court uh, after Scott's death. And uh, he stood up prior to his sentencing and he said, I'm truly sorry for what I have done. And three and a half weeks later, on the first anniversary of Scott's death, he wrote to Mike in prison and told him about his anger uh, and asked some questions. And then he said this, he said, having said all that, I want to thank you for what you said in court, that he was sorry for what he'd done. And as hard as these words are for me to write, I forgive you. And then he wrote about God's love um, and invited Mike to write to him whenever he wanted to. Then he got an, a letter back three weeks later um, from Mike. And, the letter, and he said, Mike said, when I read your letter, I couldn't believe it. No one has ever said to me, I forgive you. That night, I knelt beside my bunk and prayed for and received the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then, uh, after additional correspondence and regular visits, uh, when he spoke about Mike's relationship with the Lord and they prayed together, um, he said, uh, he, said he, he spoke on behalf of Mike at a parole board. And Mike was given an early release. He said, in, and in November 1994, I was the officiating minister at his wedding. Mm. <laughs> I like this, though. He says, when Mike was released, uh, he was asked how he felt. And he said, he said, I felt good, but I was already out of prison. God had set me free when I asked for his forgiveness. For freedom, God has set us free. Do you know, every pastor should preach one message at, le a year, at least to his congregation and implore them to make sure you have forgiven everybody that you know in your life. Don't leave any stone unturned. You heard what I said about Jesus on the cross and it just cut away every excuse, did it not? Every excuse is gone, which says, well, how can I? Why should I? That's how. The answer is always at the cross, isn't it? It's always at the cross. Father, we pray now in Jesus' precious, wonderful name that you'll help us to be kind and compassionate to one another and forgiving one another, forgiving those we know around us from our past, if there's anybody that uh, uh, we have any rancor toward or any bitterness towards, please forgive us. Show us and enable us to forgive them, Lord, and release them. Because, Lord, we once ourselves were enemies of yours, but you made us your best friends. Thank you for the gospel, Lord. Thank you the gospel still changes our lives today. Fill us with your love and joy, we pray.
In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.